Earlier this week, Ontario's Chief Medical Officer of Health strongly recommended people wear masks in all indoor public settings. It's not what anyone wanted to hear. Is it a worrisome sign of a tough winter ahead? Let's find out from Dr. Mustafa Hirji, Acting Medical Officer of Health for Niagara Region, who joins us tonight from Thorold, Ontario. Hi, Dr. Hirji. It's nice to see you again. Hi, Jason. Nice to be on again. Um, it's been a really heavy week in the province. Uh, it just seems as if there's a lot of things happening when it comes to our health. Uh, what can Ontarians expect from COVID-19 this fall and winter? Yeah, it's, you know, always um, a bit difficult to try to stare into the crystal ball because none of us has a great view of the future. And we're in a little bit of uncharted territory with a first season where we have COVID plus flu plus other viruses going around. We also unfortunately don't right now have any kind of modeling similar to the modeling we used to get from the Ontario Science Table. But, you know, the best guesses I can say is really looking at what we've seen in past winters is that as we get deeper into winter, unfortunately, infections start to get worse. And that was even true the last couple of winters when we're dealing with COVID-19, where unfortunately, in both the past Decembers, we ended up going into lockdowns with really crushing waves of COVID-19. And that's just because I think the winter, the fundamental environment of winter, makes it more hospitable to these viruses spreading. It's colder. We all move indoors. We are approaching the holidays. We start having holiday gatherings. And that gives an environment where the virus is just able to spread more. On top of that, just background, we have a situation right now where there's fairly low vaccine uptake in Ontario. You know, we've obviously people have gotten those first two doses in great numbers, but in terms of a fall booster, it's about 15% of our population right now has that fall booster. So there's a lot of people who don't have that additional protection that we've been recommending for this fall. And of course, then on the topic of masks, I don't think we've really seen many people wearing masks anymore. That's really eroded since the mandates went away. Mm -hmm. And at least, you know, from my perspective over the last few days, I have not really seen that uptick very, very much with the recommendation for masking. And then lastly, we, of course, have always the potential that a new variant could arise. So my sincere worry is that, you know, more likely than not, things are going to get worse now before they get better in terms of respiratory viruses. And I think it's why we want to take some measures to make sure we're better protected in the near term and then some real long-term measures so we can better get have control of this for the long term. Uh, you brought up um, a lot of things that I, I'd like to have a few follow-ups on. You mentioned that we don't really have data right now. And... Um, I think people may be under the impression that because the mandates are gone, we had um, a nice summer, people might not be aware of how much COVID is in our communities or that COVID is still something that we should be really concerned with. Uh, you mentioned a variant, or do we know, is there a dominant variant right now? Yeah, so, you know, you mentioned we had a pretty good summer, and I'd say it's relatively good, but, you know, here in Niagara, our August actually had the most deaths from COVID-19 since February of 2021, which is, of course, before we were doing mass vaccination. So definitely it wasn't that good, unfortunately. We did see a couple of waves over the summer, and we did sadly see a lot of people pass away due to COVID-19. In terms of the variants going around, you know, it's really become a plethora of many different variants that are spreading. The main variant still seems to be the BA5 variant, which was the one that we were seeing in the latter part of the summer. But as opposed to being, you know, 80, 90 percent of our infections, it's close to maybe 50 percent. And we've been seeing this family of variants called the BQ variants, the BQ dots, you know, various different numbers. They seem to have risen quite quickly over the last month. They've gone from about 5 percent to close to about 30 percent of the variants that we're seeing going around. And what's worrying about them is that there's some evidence that these variants that the past immunity we have from COVID-19 isn't going to protect us as well against these variants. It looks like, of course, the you know protection against hospitalizations, deaths, that's going to remain pretty good, but it's not going to remain as good as it was before. We don't know a lot to yet, I think. We're still learning a bit more about these variants, but that does give me a little bit of caution that things could get a little bit worse in the next few months because of these COVID variants. Um, you mentioned um, how Niagara had the most deaths in August. I can't even imagine what that, how that's impacted people in that community. And I think that would be a very surprising thing for a lot of us to hear. You mentioned that hospitalizations and deaths um, might not be as bad. It, are you concerned because... Uh, with the level of people getting updated on their vaccines, are you concerned that this winter might see more people ending up in the hospital dying? I think that's absolutely the possibility. And I think the primary driver would be, as I talked about, 
the winter period is going to be a time when it's easier for these viruses to spread. More people are going to get infected. So that fraction of people who unfortunately end up with severe disease in a hospital or worst of all pass away is going to be a larger group. And then if we get new variants, that, of course, you know, throws another wrench in the works, which could potentially make things worse. Just to quickly speak on the topic of hospitalizations and deaths, you know, I, I don't think, you know, we should, uh, you know, ignore the fact that things are a lot better than they used to be. We are not seeing people hospitalized or passing away from COVID-19 at nearly the same rate as they used to be. We've made a lot of progress, and that's principally thanks to the fact that over 90% of Canadian adults have gotten vaccinated, and they have that protection. But the flip side is also true that we haven't completely gotten rid of COVID-19 as a problem. Here in Ontario, we're seeing approximately, I think, about 1,500 people on any day who are currently in the hospital. So not necessarily new hospitalizations, but a total census of people hospitalized is about 1,500 people a day. So 1,500 hospital beds a day are occupied by people with COVID-19. And we're seeing about 16 to 17 people every day passing away from COVID-19, which is up from about six weeks ago when it was closer to nine or 10 people. So definitely it has gotten worse. And what's I think most disappointing to me is that when I look at the number of deaths we've had in Ontario, you know, in each year of the pandemic, in 2020, we had a little over 4,400 deaths. In 2021, a little over 5,300 deaths, so a worse year. So far in 2022, we have just under 5,300. And last year, we had a little over 5,300. And probably within the next week or so, we're going to eclipse last year's total so that 2022 will have been the most deadly year of this pandemic so far. You know, COVID-19 is a number three cause of death in Canada. It is, I think, still a serious problem, definitely a problem that's not as bad as it used to be, but one I don't think we should be ignoring. And we need to take both some short-term measures to make sure this fall and winter isn't as bad as it could be, as well as some longer-term measures so we can make sure that future falls and winters aren't going to be as bad. We still have uh, about six weeks left of this year, so um, we'll be watching that number. You mentioned vaccines. We have the bivalent vaccine. What's the uptake been like for that? Yeah, so the, I talked about the fall booster dose, and that's probably pretty much on par with what the bivalent vaccine is, because the bivalent vaccine came out, I think, the second week of September. So really, all the vaccines we've given over the fall have been the bivalent vaccine, except for children under 18. And so it's probably around 15% of people have gotten it. So it's definitely not nearly as high as I think we would like to see it. You know, so I think there's a, probably a few reasons for that. And, you know, obviously, I'm, you know, speculating a little bit here polling that would be done could probably get a more accurate reason why. But I think first off is a lot of the urgency to get vaccination is lost. I think back in 2021, there's a huge urgency to get vaccinated to hopefully get out of the pandemic. And it absolutely made this pandemic much less serious, which is why our society has been able to reopen. We've returned to a large degree back to normal. But it didn't completely solve the problem. And we do need to keep getting these booster doses. Second thing I think has been a challenge is that there's been misinformation, I think, floating around. And I think it's gotten louder over the last year. And so I think some people who are maybe more on the fence of getting vaccines are hearing more misinformation. It's giving them a bit more pause. I think some people are also perhaps suffering from a little, you know, missed expectations. They thought that when they got those two doses, things would be better. And then it wasn't better. And we keep recommending booster doses. And that's maybe giving them reason that they're confused. And unfortunately, that gives an opportunity for the misinformation to feed in. But the one other thing I highlight is that I don't think we've had the strong promotion of this vaccine anymore. Mm. I haven't really seen the big campaigns by the federal government or the provincial government. I haven't seen the radio ads, the TV ads, the mail outs that went to everybody's home from the federal government, really pushing people and encouraging us to go out and get that bivalent dose. And I think that's a big reason why we haven't seen as good uptake. And we really need to sell this dose and the importance of getting it. Well, you mentioned confusion. I think some people um, might be confused. I'm confused and we've been covering this for the past three years now. So help us uh, clear up that confusion. If you've never had a COVID vaccine and you're considering getting it, do you, can you get the bivalent vaccine? When do you get the bivalent vaccine? And do you get a flu shot or, can you, can you clear that up for us? For sure. So the first two doses of vaccine you get are going to be the old version of the vaccine. The bivalent vaccine is a good for a booster dose, so after your first two doses. But the first two doses are the previous version. Absolutely recommend if you have not yet gotten those two doses and you're thinking about it, it's never too late to make that decision to go get that vaccine. Absolutely go get it. It cuts your risk of being hospitalized, having a severe outcome by about a factor of nine. So it's much, much safer to have those two doses of vaccine. If you've had, no matter how many doses or doses you've had so far, everybody who's had two doses can get a booster dose this fall. If you've had no booster doses, one, two, three, doesn't matter. Everybody's eligible for a fall booster dose. 
So if you're age 12 and up, come out, get that fall booster dose so you can have the best protection going forward for the rest of this fall winter season. For children who are age 5 to 11, if they've had their two doses, they can also get a booster dose after six months. So strongly recommend they do that if it's been six months since they had their second dose. And then for children who are the youngest age group, six months up to four years of age, they're also eligible to get two doses of vaccine. So very much recommend they go out, get that protection, and make sure they're safe. I think we've all heard the stories about the hospitalizations of children over the last couple of weeks. Um, really, really sad stories about children who are struggling to breathe. And I, I can't imagine how anguishing that must be for the families who have a child like that. Let's make sure COVID is not going to be a cause that causes some children to be hospitalized to make sure make sure they have that vaccine so they're protected. We also know that um, the flu season started earlier this mm -hmm. year. So how do you make the determination if you need a COVID booster uh, versus getting a flu shot? How do you make that decision? Yeah, the great thing is that it's not actually a decision to make. You can go out and get both of those. If you're getting your first couple doses of uh, COVID vaccine, you can get your flu shot at the same time. If you're getting a booster dose of the COVID vaccine, you can get your flu shot at the same time. Go out, get both of them in the same visit and make sure you get the protection from both right away. But what if you've had uh, COVID recently? Can you get the bivalent and the flu shot? You can get it. A um, one? Yeah, so uh, as soon as you're out of isolation, you can actually get your COVID vaccine right away. It's generally advised that that's not the best time to get it because your immune system is already just revved up to fight off COVID-19. So you've got a bit of immunity from that. So the recommendation is really wait about three months and that's when you're going to get the best benefit for getting that booster shot. So if you've had COVID recently, wait about three months, then go out and get that booster shot, but still go out and get your influenza shot so you have that protection right away. Um, some health authorities, we mentioned, you mentioned children. Uh, some health authorities say that everyone 12 and older should get the bivalent shot at least two months after their last vaccine dose. Others say between three to six months is the ideal time. What do you think? Yeah, you know, the National Advisory Committee on Immunizations has our best experts in terms of vaccinations in Canada, and their advice has really been to get it in, in that three to six month period. So that's really what I recommend. There's a little bit of a range there, and I think it's really a trade-off of, do you want that protection earlier, and then you go closer to the three months? Or do you want to have the kind of longest, strongest, long-lasting protection where you go closer to six months? Mm -hmm. Thinking about, you know, just how we're likely going to get a, you know, spike of COVID-19 when we go into December and January, just looking at the fact that it happened the last two years and we went into lockdown in December the last two years. Well, I'm not expecting lockdown. I am expecting probably there will be a surge. So I suggest that if you're past the three months point, get that vaccine in December so you have the protection going into that most dangerous period in December and January. You mentioned a surge um, earlier this week. Health Minister Sylvia Jones said that this uh, this week, while cases of flu and RSV are still going up, the pace has slowed. Does this give us hope that we're coming to a plateau? It's certainly, I think, a reason to maybe be hopeful, but I think it's always dangerous to put too much stock into hope. Uh, seeing a plateauing one week doesn't necessarily tell us there's a trend over multiple weeks and it's, you know, kind of trying to guess what's going to happen in the future. And again, we don't have any crystal balls. It's, I think, certainly something I'm hoping so that we can see some relief for our hospitals and especially for the children who I think have been particularly hard hit by the recent infections. But the best thing we can do to help turn that hope into reality mm -hmm. is do the things that are going to keep us safe and limit the spread of the virus, which means getting that COVID booster, that flu shot, so we have that protection making sure we're wearing masks in indoor spaces so that we're limiting the ability of the virus to spread and making sure that we stay home when we're sick so we're not spreading that infection out to anybody else. And that, I think, is how we can help make sure that hope turns into reality. Well, we're hearing from more and more experts that we're likely seeing a double or triple cohort effect, uh, that an immunity gap, post-COVID immune dysregulation, and higher circulation of respiratory viruses are contributing to the surge in illnesses. What do you think is going on? Yeah, you know, so I think you've raised a few different topics there, and I'll break this down a little bit. You know, ultimately, I don't think we know for sure what's happening, and it could well actually be a combination of various different factors. One of the things you mentioned is this idea of an immunity gap, or some people call it an immunity debt. And this is the idea that because we've done so much over the last two years that protected people from infection, maybe our immune systems aren't as ready now to face other infections this year. So that's why perhaps children are being hospitalized in greater numbers than usual because the infections are hitting them harder. I don't think that really makes a lot of sense. This is a very novel theory. There's not a lot of evidence or really any evidence, I think, yet to back it up. 
But our bodies are consistently exposed to bacteria all around us. And we saw other viruses still spread over the last couple of years. So our immune systems are always active. I really don't think that this immunity death idea really makes a lot of sense. So I think it's really doubtful that that's behind what's happening here. The double triple cohort effect is the idea that because the last couple seasons we stopped so many infections, there's people who didn't get the immunity from having, say, you know, something like RSV. And so now, you know, there's a larger group of people who've never been exposed to RSV. And so we're going to see more people infected this year than usual. You know, that is a, something that we have seen happen in reality. But what we actually saw with RSV is that while well, two winters ago, we pretty much suppressed RSV and it wasn't around. Last year, RSV did spread, and we actually had a twice as large wave than usual, which kind of fits that twice as many people got infected because we skipped one year of people getting infected, so we all caught up with that. And so because we had that larger wave of RSV, I don't think it really explains why more people are getting severely ill this year, particularly more children getting severely ill. The other thing I'll note is that the people who would get RSV would usually be our youngest children. Once children are about two years of age, they've been infected with RSV. So we'd be thinking it'd be three-year-olds, four-year-olds who would have missed getting infected the last couple of years who might be more susceptible and more likely to get it this year. But we've seen the hospitalization trends, even for children aged 5 to 17, go up quite drastically over the last few weeks. So I do think there's something else going on beyond just this idea of the cohort effect. The final one you mentioned is immune dysregulation. And this is something we've seen with some viruses, that some viruses, after they infect us, they actually cause some haywire and some weakness to our immune system. So for the next several weeks or several months, any other infection that comes along is going to be more severe for us. We've seen this, for example, with measles, and we've seen it actually with COVID-19 as well. Don't know if this is what's happening, but it's certainly a plausible theory that children who had COVID-19 in the last few months, their immune systems are weakened. So when they're getting RSV this fall, it's unfortunately more severe for them. And that's why maybe some of them are being hospitalized in greater numbers. Likewise, influenza is more severe, and that's why we're seeing more emergency department visits and hospitalizations from it. Again, I don't think we have any hard data showing that this is the case, but it's definitely a worrying possibility. And I think that's why we want to take some action right now to make sure we mitigate any impact of that, causing people to get severely ill. So again, you know, masks, vaccines, staying home with sick are what are going to help us through the next little while. And then we need to really think about some longer term adaptations to make sure our society is just generally more resistant to these viruses long term. Uh, so far, we only have Paxlovid to treat COVID. How does it help and who should have access to it? Yeah, so Paxlovid is a uh, medication that can treat people who are infected with COVID-19. It's a great medication for people who are particularly at high risk of hospitalizations. It quite substantially reduces the risk of being hospitalized by like 80 or 90 percent. The people who should get it are the people who are highest risk of having those severe outcomes, such as hospitalization. So that's generally people who are older, people with underlying medical conditions, and people who haven't made that good choice to get vaccination and don't have that protection from vaccines. What I'd really recommend is if you're in one of these groups, talk to your doctor about Paxovid. Make sure you understand the process to get it, because once you do get COVID-19, there's only a few days where you're able to get it. You need to start that medication right away for it to have benefit. So if you can figure out what the process is, the lab testing and other things you're going to need to get done, that'll make sure that you have no resistance on the way to getting it. So I would really recommend people speak to the doctor about it if they're in one of those groups who's elderly, has underlying medical conditions, etc. Well, you mentioned action. Uh, this uh, past Monday, Dr. Moore very st strongly recommended a return to indoor masking. He stopped short of a mandate. Uh, what needs to happen to protect kids and to prevent the future collapse of our healthcare system? Yeah, so I think absolutely the uh, recommendation to wear masks is a good one. It's one I've definitely been articulating here in Niagara for a while. Do we need masks, a mandate? Uh, you know, m my thought is we probably do. As I mentioned, you know, the last few days, I've not really seen more people wearing masks. And I don't think that's actually because people don't believe in masks. I think it's actually more to do with the psychology that we are human beings, that we're just hardwired to conform to the people around us. And if other people aren't wearing masks, it's really hard to be the only person in the room wearing a mask. And, you know, I say this from experience because often I am the only person in a room wearing a mask. And what we saw back in 2020 is that while we had a recommendation for wearing masks, it wasn't a lot of people who are wearing it. 
when we went to mandates, people pretty much all of a sudden voluntarily all started to just start to wear masks. There wasn't much enforcement to make it happen. People just started to do it because it made the social norm. And so I think for a short period of time, we do need a temporary mandate to once again create that social norm so that kids and everybody else in our society is protected from the severe outcomes from these viral illnesses. But I also just want to emphasize that we're not just looking at the short term, that we also think about the long term and long term adaptations our society needs to do in terms of ventilation, filtration, paid sick days and other things that can make us safe from these viruses long term. Dr. Hirji, thank you so much for this. We really appreciate your time and insights. Thank you. You're very welcome. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.